Good morning and welcome to the Communication and Stakeholder Engagement Committee meeting on this day, Tuesday, September the 28th, 2021. I am Shebra Evans, Chair of the Committee. And at this time, I want to acknowledge my colleagues, beginning with Vice President Silvestre. Good morning. Mrs. Smondrowski. Good morning. Great. And we also have with us board staff, Ms. Webb, you can introduce yourself as well. Good morning, Lori Christina Webb. Great. We have others joining us today and you will hear from each of them. So I just ask all of you to um, just acknowledge yourself and your position within the school system and if you're a student or a parent. So thank you very much for joining us. At this time, I just wanna ask my colleagues, you've had a chance to look at the informational summary. Were there any edits or questions? Okay, saying that. Okay, great, thank you. And so good morning again. We are so grateful that you all decided to join us this morning. Um, we are the Communication and Stakeholder Engagement Committee, as I stated earlier. This is the second year that we have um, revitalized this, this committee. Um, on exactly September the 17th, 2019, we came together to reinstate the Communication and Stakeholder Engagement Committee because we believe that it was really important for us to continue to update our staff, our community, our students, our parents, everyone on best practices. We are such a vast school system. Our landscape is ever changing. As you can see, during COVID-19, we've had to pivot and um, adjust how we um, teach and how we engage. And so we thought it's important to continue to come to you to bring you accurate and up-to-date information. And so at this time, I'm gonna ask um, Mr. Cram and others to join. We um, are coming forward today with a annual plan for the communication and stakeholder communications um, committee and we've um, sent that information, that annual plan to you all. Typically, we have um, separate meetings to introduce this plan, but you know things change, and we've had a lot um, happen um, in our board office this year. And so I'm bringing forward that plan with my colleagues, and you've had a chance to look that over. And I just wanted to, um, you know, get you all's approval on what the committee would like to work on for this year and discuss. We have, um, today we'll be discussing evolving traditions. We have on here community expectations. We want our, um, well, for, I'll just go back with evolving traditions. What we do know is that people are really tied to what they know and understand. Our traditions mean so much to all of our families, you know, and we want to um, make certain that our parents see their shared values and the traditions that we have at our school system. So you'll hear today how traditions are evolving as a result of us um, being in person and at times being virtual. So we'll be looking forward to the discussion that we'll have later today. And then we have communication expectations. We want our community to know what to expect when you hear from your schools at the district level, as well as from your, um, your, your child's teacher. And then we will um, also have a meeting discussing how the board advocates. Not many people know all the things that the Board of Education members do on a daily basis. And we are, um, of course, tasked with the oversight of the school system, but we engage our county and state local officials. We go outside and, um, and speak with our community members. And so we just wanted to have that discussion at the table so our community can hear and know all the things that we're doing on behalf of not only our students, but our staff and the community abroad. And then we will have a discussion on our partners. You know, education is everyone's business. And so we are so appreciative that we have partners that we can tap to help support us, um, particularly during the pandemic. It was really important that we had our partners help. We could not do this alone. We do not do this alone. And so we will um, have those discussions too. So if I can get the support of our colleagues on this annual plan that we presented before you and we'll bring before the full board on October 5th. I would appreciate that. Are there any questions, comments? Any 
adjustments to the plan that you see? Yes, Ms. Silvestri. Uh, yes, so um, the, the annual plan, each topic is a different meeting, is that correct? That is correct. The annual plan, each topic is a different meeting. We typically have about four meetings in one year. Every year we bring forward an annual plan for our committee to um, briefly discuss. And then um, at each meeting going forward, we we have those um, meetings presented. Yeah, um, just a couple of things that I'd like to add and wherever it fits throughout the year. Um, in terms of communications with our uh, multilingual communities, um, just thinking out loud here, um, if we could insert it uh, maybe in the communications expectations meeting, the system, the school, and the classroom, Ooh, and what should communications look like yep. from school, from the um, system, the teacher. Um, I'm very interested in um, bilingual staff and their being in front offices of schools so that when families come, uh, they feel welcome and they feel like they could communicate their needs to the school community or and or use of the language line. Um, I'm also very interested in teachers ability to communicate with parents. You may have heard my story um, when I first came to MCPS. I was the Latino liaison for my daughter's elementary school and I was asked to translate uh, PTA flyers. And um, after doing that for a while, I realized nobody was reading them. And so I was, uh, I was able to do a phone survey of all the families that um, said they spoke Spanish at the school. And I asked them three questions. What communications do you want translated to Spanish? From the system, from the principal, from your child's teacher. 99.9% .9 wanted to know what the teacher was saying. Um, and so I, uh, 13 years later, I'm still very interested in this topic uh, to see what tools we have made available to teachers. What are they really using? Because I know what now with technology, there's apps and things that they use, things that we have put in place through our uh, parent portal but then there's also things that they use organically uh, because it seems to work for them. And so um, that is uh, something that's very um, important and I think it's very um, pertinent to this uh, committee. And finally, a tradition that is not on the list here, uh, unless I'm missing here, is the parent-teacher conferences. And again, um, those are going to be in November now, right? Along uh, the week of Thanksgiving. And we always struggle with uh, translation interpretation because there's just so much volume all at one time. And so I think that uh, we still need uh, to do some work uh, to ensure that our families um, have the ability to make the most of that meeting. Um, but in now this year that, you know, we're, as I tell the community every chance I get, the, the ability to communicate with your child's teacher over academic progress is gonna be even more critical. And so, you know, they shouldn't have to wait until parent-teacher conferences, but um, how, are we, how are we thinking about um, how to welcome, presenting information to them about what their child's progress um, and giving them the ability to, um, comment on it or ask questions. So um, a lot there, just wanted to um, share those things um, that I, I hope we can incorporate into the agenda throughout the year. Not a lot at all, very good feedback and we definitely can do that. And for all I know, um, we have quite a few administrators on here. They could touch on what parent conference could look like. And if not, um, I know that they are very much aware how important it will be to communicate that in advance to our parents and our community. So um, thank you 
from Ms. Sebestri for that feedback. And Mrs. Smondrowski, if you don't have anything to add, I saw you nodding, so I know you were definitely in agreement with Ms. Sebestri if you weren't already thinking that and she beat you to it. Yep. 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 Well, yeah, and I also just wanted to clarify that on the um, the sheet, the, the worksheet that we got, um, there's only one, today's date is the only one on there. And I'm assuming, so I just wanted to clarify that these are topics for different dates. It's just, um, we just haven't necessarily nailed down the specific date yet. And you are correct. Those are okay. topics for different dates that are coming up and we will um, disclose those dates to the community. So thank you for that. Great. Yeah, no, and I also just want to say um, thank you to Ms. Silvestri for her um, points there both in terms of how we're um, reaching out to families in different languages and things like that. But, you know, the, uh, we frequently hear about um, inconsistencies in how schools communicate with families and um, kind of just incorporating that into some of that discussion would be helpful as well. Yes, and that is exactly the point that we really wanted to have this public discussion so that there is consistency and that our community is aware. So thank you, Mrs. Smodrowski, for being, bringing that up. Thank you both for your feedback. And um, we have everyone on the Zoom that will be helping to put um, our meetings together, the planning together, so it's not too late. And I took notes as well. And so with that, um, thank you for your approval of the annual plan. We will bring that forward to the board on October the 5th, and we will definitely include those additions that you mentioned. And so um, at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Cram, because now we're gonna go into our very first presentation. And so as you all know, um, everyone, they're tied to the traditions, right? And so as stated earlier, it's evolving, right, as a result of us being um, virtual and wanting to stay safe and thinking about the safety and security of all of our students and our staff. And so just really appreciative to everyone that has joined our call to share how um, we are continuing to keep some traditions and if there's been some changes what that looks like. So Mr. Cram, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Evans. And Ms. Silvestre and Ms. Mondrowski, what you've pointed out with the plan for the year and the added points is the importance of communications as foundational to, you know, making sure that our families and other key audiences are connected to MCPS because that information is so very important. And part of that story begins today. I think we have some great presentations that will help you understand what schools are doing now, maybe a little bit differently to connect to families. If I could first recognize some of our uh, co-presenters that are here today that uh, regularly come to this committee meeting. And if I could uh, recognize Mr. Cebanini first, would you introduce yourself, please? Sure, thank you, sure. thank you, Chris. I'm Cebanini, the Associate Superintendent for Technology and Innovation. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Cebanini. Uh, Ms. Barakas? Good morning, Margarita Borquez, Acting Director of Student family and school services, including international enrollment. Thank you, and Mr. Davis. Yes, thank you, Mr. Cram. Good morning, everyone. Everett Davis, Acting Associate Superintendent for Student Family Support and Engagement. So Mr. Davis, in that role and his previous role as a principal, is uh, keenly aware of uh, the challenges and the importance of connecting families to schools. And I'm going to ask him to introduce our guests today and to uh, set up the theme, which you've outlined for our first meeting, which is evolving tradition. So, Mr. Davis, could you start us off, please? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Cram. And again, thank you to Ms. Evans, to Ms. Silvestre, Ms. Mondrowski, uh, and Ms. Webb uh, for this opportunity this morning to share a little bit with you uh, around communication and stakeholder engagement which is a topic that is not only a passion of mine, as Chris said, uh, Mr. Cram said in my previous role and current role, uh, but it's also a critical part of the work that we do as educators, particularly as we strive to engage our entire MCPS community while continuing to navigate a pandemic. That being said, engaging our community is a non-negotiable, but how we do so presents many opportunities for creativity and innovation. 
We are fortunate to have with us today three of our principals, as well as members of their community who have used the pandemic to embrace the creative problem-solving challenge of maintaining school traditions, such as back to school night, open house, homecoming, uh, as well as parent-teacher conferences, as you heard Ms. Silvestri mention, in a COVID-friendly way. We look forward to hearing about their evolving traditions and how they have still managed to engage their school communities, even if it is in a different and non-traditional way. For example, I know that at my own son's, my oldest son's high school, they're having a homecoming this year uh, on the tennis courts. So again, how do they maintain uh, those traditions in a non-traditional way? So before we hear from our principals, I would be remiss if I did not recognize uh, the MCPS colleagues, which I think you've already heard them um, introduce themselves, and their work directly aligns with communication and stakeholder engagement. So just thankful to have them with us today, uh, both in the in the virtual at the virtual table as well as in the virtual audience. So now to our principals, and I want to thank them first of all for taking their time uh, away from their school day to be with us. And regarding traditions, each principal will share their perspective on what has been lost, what they're still working on, and what they figured out. So first, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Carol Sample, who is the principal at Jones Lane Elementary School. Welcome, Dr. Sample. Thank you so much, Mr. Davis. So I will turn it over to you at, at this time, Dr. Oh. Sample, to get us started. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Well, good morning, everyone. I It is indeed a pleasure and an honor to be asked to present our story of traditions, evolving traditions, before, during, and now that we're back in five days a week school in what many call our new normal. I am so delighted, but also very honored, like I said, to be presenting to our esteemed Board of Education members and this committee. I want to preface my story, our story um, of evolving traditions by saying that what I'm about to share is not unusual to our amazing principal colleagues. And in fact, many of the ideas I will share with you have been shared by a colleague somewhere, somewhere here in the district. We share a lot through our meetings, through principals' messages on emails. And our motto is do not reinvent the wheel. We will share with each other and we will do what is appropriate for our schools and our community. So our story of engagement can be summarized in the African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. And is about, and it is really all about the supports that we received and continue to receive from, and in some cases reciprocated, from all the available resources through our, our district. There are many to thank along this journey, and I will get to that a little bit later. There's so many, um, and I, I would be remiss if I did not thank those folks who continue to support us. The term it takes a village to raise a child is an African proverb that means that an entire community of people must provide for and interact positively with children for those children to experience and grow in a safe and healthy environment. So what does it mean when we hear an entire community of people must provide for and interact? Um, this was our charge at the school, at our school, as we thought about how we needed to pivot very quickly from in-person to virtual learning. And it came as a, very, a lot of surprise to many of us, as you all know. And now we're back to five days a week learning. We never for a moment thought that we could exist on an island by ourselves. We always started to look at how we could get help and support. Through it all, we kept safety and student engagement and parent engagement both um, academically, social, emotionally, and knowing that we needed our parents' support at the forefront of all that we did, because we knew we needed the help and support from these key stakeholders who were also invested in helping us. I can't tell you how many parents reached out to us and say, what can we do? How can we help you? What do you need? 
And we just had to sit back, take a deep breath and say, we're going to figure this out and we'll figure this out together. So we are forever grateful for the collaboration and the collaborative efforts and partnership with these groups of stakeholders. That includes our MCPS officials, our directors, our associate superintendents. It also includes our staff members, our PTA and our parent community partners. Wow, we I can't tell you how key they were. Central office supports that included the technology offices, curriculum, school operations, maintenance departments, to name a few. The folks who gave us advice and guidance for um, so many areas, particularly around student needs. I would re be remiss if I did not take time to send out special thanks and kudos to the transportation department. Kudos to the Clarksburg Transportation Office, who honestly never said no to any request we made to get materials out. We have a group of um, our students who live in the Gaithersburg City area, and many of our families don't have the transportation to come out. They worked with us. They worked with us to pack materials and get those out to our families. We shared with our PTA once that they were doing this, that these were just bus drivers and folks who weren't particularly working at that time, who made themselves available to support our schools. And our PTA came through and had lunches for them, grab and go lunches as they were at the school helping us to pass out materials. So it is a truly a community effort and we could not do it without our partners. So in terms of looking at the evolving pieces and looking at it from the traditions, evolving traditions and what we've lost, I've made some bullet points to kind of help you to understand where we are, but how thankful we are for everything we have at this time. So what we've lost, I would say certainly would be in terms of evolving traditions, and you have all heard of this, it came out this week in terms of test scores, there is a learning loss for many of our students. Uh, it shows now that it came out this week, the data shows that some MCPS students um, experienced learning loss. And we knew that, we, could, we knew that we didn't even have to wait for the data to come out, we could tell. Um, so we are working on those things. We wanna make sure um, that our students, even though there is loss, that they are back with us, that they feel supported and that they know we're here. Another loss I would say would be a sense of innocence, the sense that things would always be the same. And there were so many things we took for granted. There was a reality check for all of us that we needed to be able to pivot quickly and make the necessary adjustments to survive these ongoing challenges. And of course, the loss initially, but I'll, there's, there's a happy ending to many of our parent volunteer supports in the building. And again, we made up for that. Like I said, there's a, there's a happy ending by having some virtual supports. And I'll share that with you when we get to the part about what we finally thought about and what we figured out. So at this time, I'd like to share a video from one of our teachers on her perspective of what she felt was lost. Um, and that is uh, 0150, please. Hi, Ms. Winnegar. Hello. Thank you so much for sharing our, your experience from the past year in virtual and back to five days a week in school. You're going to be talking to us about some things you feel we've lost, what we figured out, and what we're still working on. Are you ready? Yes, Please. thank you for having me. Um, so I, what I feel that we've lost are number one, that uh, I talked to my first grade team and we all felt that uh, the students lost social interaction with each other. Um, having that morning meeting every morning, um, uh, talking to each other at lunch and recess. Uh, we weren't able to do it the same on virtu during virtual. Um, also, things that they do in person, like taking turns or sharing with one another um, during reading centers or math games, that was something that we weren't able to do in the school building. We also felt that we lost um, instant feedback that we can give to our students. Our students were able to hold up the whiteboards 
and show us their work that way. But um, we did miss out on going to each desk and pulling those um, small groups um, right away when we saw something that each student that they needed to work on. Um, and then we also felt that uh, writing was very difficult. Um, we did have students hold up with their whiteboard or in their notebooks up to the screen to see their writing and we uh, had them um, make videos on canvas for us but it, uh, it was very difficult to be able to teach them the entire writing process and to sit next to them and help them through that. And the last thing that our team discussed was um, having true small groups um, and pulling students to our small group table while other students were working on reading centers. We were able to do small groups but it was not the same as when we were in person. Thank you. As you can see, our, our teachers all went right back to their number one concern, and that was that learning and the loss of learning and what they felt they did in terms of making up for some of the things that we could not do, that evolve, those evolving traditions. So now I'm going to move to what we figured out. I will say, first of all, we figured out how to pivot and make accommodation for the things that we felt we've lost. We lost. We figured out how to come up with ways to fully engage students for learning and also deal with the social emotional part of that learning. Um, parent contacts were really important. We couldn't do, we couldn't have visitations because we were all in, in, in virtual at the initial pieces, but the technology supports were really key. We figured out more effective ways of communication. We needed to communicate more messages directly to parents in many ways, not just electronically. We had, you know, our, we know our, our part of our community um, needed some supports in technology. So we needed to get them supported in many ways. And everyone came on board in terms of helping us to reach many of our families who still were not connected fully. Uh, we had to translate messages for our Spanish speaking families quickly and we had to do it because we we would not we did not want to send out anything unless it went to all of our families and they could know and understand and if they weren't using the technology we would get on the phones and we would use language line we use many different ways to communicate with our families and of course we always had um, translators here at the school um, secretaries anyone who could help help us to reach our families Teachers also sent uh, weekly messages to the parents to keep them apprised on what is happening. Uh, Mrs. Sylvester, you are so right. What my PTA presidents told, told me once, she said, yes, your messages, they listen to that, they read it, but they really, really pay attention to what the teachers send out. So we know that that's really important that parents are really zeroing in on those messages. Um, we conferenced on Zoom. In fact, I felt like when we had the conferences, parent-teacher conferences, that we were able to get more parents because they didn't have to do a lot of the traveling to the school. We so that we will always have that option. I would I would imagine for parents now because we met with so many more parents than we would have under normal circumstances. Those evolving evolving traditions. Um, we had to figure out how much communication was enough. Sometimes I know my messages, my you know, connect messages were just loaded with things. Um, so we had to really kind of balance. There are some parents who said, we want to know everything. Others only want to know the important things. So we had to come to a balance with that. But the communication is constant. It is never changing. And even this year, we are still kind of, you know, figuring all of that piece out. We learned and we figured out how to define different roles. We had to have some people do certain things. For instance, I asked my assistant principal to take the leadership on um, all the technology pieces and connecting with families about that because we had many families who needed extra support. So we really had to make sure that everyone had a role and everyone was playing their part in the role to really communicate with our families. Um, and then we figured out how to get materials, not only to families and students, but also to teachers. When we first went out, we needed to get teachers that they need to get up on technology. And literally we had to stand, we stood in our parking lot because we couldn't get in the building at, at some times and handed out the document cameras to the teachers so they could go home and work on how to communicate with families 
through the through the lessons that we were getting ready to start. So everyone came on board, everyone helped. And again, it was it was just a community of of, of folks working together. We figured out also how to make it feel as much as possible. A, a, a productive year, particularly last year, I'm speaking of for our fifth graders who were getting ready to transition to middle school. We worked it out so that our fifth graders who actually uh, went to middle school this particular year, at the end of the year, we had, we made it so it wasn't a yearbook, but we called it a, a remembrance book. And the, the students appropriately called it a year like no other. And it is a memory book of all of our fifth graders. So we tried to make those traditions as much as possible with the help of parents. It was a wonderful, wonderful um, result of everyone working together. We, I couldn't have done it. I helped with the pictures, but the parents also got together and got baby pictures and th everything we needed. So it was truly a year like no other, but we couldn't have done it without our community support. Kudos, kudos, kudos to our parents. And finally, I just wanna say in this particular part, we partnered with our uh, PTA for what they called PTA Tuesdays. So that those things that we used to do in the building, we used to do a traditional um, cultural awareness a week and we used to do ability awareness and we used to have celebrations um, through the PTA, through the building, things that we were doing. The PTA figured out and we partnered with them on how to have something by Zoom every, every Tuesday nights, or I should say most, not all, but most Tuesday nights. And we had things like Hispanics uh, Heritage Celebration, Halloween uh, Sing Along with Mr. O'Grady, our parent that's here today, that's representing our school, Mr. Krishnan did a science with his boys, a science activity. And it was usually on Tuesday nights, it was seven o'clock. I was exhausted every Tuesday, but I probably, I don't think I missed any. We did a Lunar New Year celebration with families um, who celebrated Lunar New Year and our entire staff and our staff members who celebrated it. It was wonderful, and I won't, I would be remiss if I didn't say, and the Q, uh, Quince Orchard High School Engineering Robotics Club, they were there. It was, it was a Tuesday, Tuesday nights, we rocked it. I just have to say, it was a wonderful celebration of our community, and our NAACP representative, Dr. Davis, worked out a wonderful, wonderful Black history celebration that I'm going to share with you at the end of this presentation, um, just a little snippet of who we are and the wonderful um, culturally diverse community that the Jones Lane community is. So at this time, I'm going to stop and just ask if you would share the video for what the staff members said we finally figured out. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about what we learned. And uh, the first thing that I I think we learned a lot is the new technology and uh, different ways of teaching students in a virtual environment. Of course, we had MCPS, Classroom, Zoom, Nearpod, Kami, Peer Deck, all those different technologies were available to us. And we also learned how to use old technologies like document cameras, online programs in new ways. Uh, we also learned how flexible and adaptive teachers can actually be. Uh, so we all did this. Teachers teaching their first year to the teachers that are about to retire had to completely revamp and retool everything in order to teach virtually. And then that was half of a year. And then when we went to hybrid, we had to do it all over again. All right, what we have figured out um, during virtual learning is um, using technology to help us. Our team found this amazing website called Pear Deck where we can use Google Slides to create a lesson and we add the Pear Deck app to it and we give the, a link to our students and we can see student feedback right away. So as they're doing problems, we were able to check in and see what they were doing. And in that moment, if I saw a student that needed help with a certain concept, I can pull them into a breakout room or um, and address it right then and there so that um, I could give them that personal feedback or if I saw the whole class that needed help with something, I could address the whole class and we can go over it together. 
We also learned how to be more flexible and how to adapt over time. So in the beginning of the year, it was a little difficult since we never did this before. But as the year went on, we grew together as a team, as a school with one another um, and helped each other with different um, websites or different um, strategies that we use. And we all collaborated together to help one another to improve um, our learning experience for our students over time. Um, we also were able to work on student social interaction. It wasn't as um, beneficial as it would have been in person, but we did um, have times in the morning where I would put students in breakout rooms so they could share something they did over the weekend with one another. Or um, when we were in reading groups, I, I had students um, ask each other questions about the book we were reading. So they still had that social interaction, just not as um, much as they would have in person, but we were working through that. And I believe that um, we did the best job that we could that, um, with what we were given. Thank you. So what we're still working on, what are our challenges? Um, and of course, I'm going to be very quick with this one. Uh, we're still working on all things we've shared with you previously. We're, um, but you know, through the lens of health and safety, that's always at the forefront. Um, for instance, uh, we had to pivot. We learned to pivot very quickly. We had originally planned for an in-person open house where the, and we did plan it around last names of parents. So we didn't plan on having a lot of parents in the building anyway, but then it was changed because of the, the, the COVID and the new variant. And we were very concerned. And so we were asked to uh, switch and we did, we switched very quickly. And of course, what we did was rather than have parents come in, the teachers, and it was, it was their ideas. They said, well, why don't we go out and meet our students? And so we literally had what that particular day, and we still did it by last names of families. But on that particular day, it was almost like, um, uh, like a fairgrounds because we put chairs under the, the, the trees for the parents and we spread everything out and the children were actually able to come to before they started school and meet their parents. So learning to pivot, learning to, um, to, to, to change quickly is something that we're still, we're, we're, we're still working out, but it's, we, we're used to it now. We just kind of say, expect the unexpected. And so, and we just kind of go with it. And of course, we're definitely still working out all the safety protocols. Um, COVID uh, is always on our minds. We're always listening and looking. There's never a day that goes by that we do, that go by that we do, that we do not have a child in you know in our uh, lunch excuse me in our health room that we're you know either wondering about or sending home. And then finally, we're also still working out the balance of all things. You know, we wanna make sure students are safe. We wanna make sure that uh, we're doing the best we can, but we definitely are so thrilled and so happy to have our students back. And we're doing everything we can to make sure in terms of safety that we can keep it this way. And we've been very fortunate. We haven't had a lot of COVID issues so far, but we're very vigilant also. We just wanna let you know. At this time, I wanna ch share what our teachers said about what they are challenged with. And then I'm going to ask our parent who is here to share his perspective on what he felt in terms of a parent point of view, what we've lost and what we have figured out and what we are still challenged with. So let's go ahead and listen to the video quickly about um, how what teachers think we're still challenged with, and then we'll move directly to our parent. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about what we're still working at on. And uh, so looking at my students this year, I can easily see which ones struggled and fell behind with virtual learning, uh, whether it be academic or social. Uh, getting those students support, figuring out the areas of need, filling in those gaps, and finding them the res resources that they'll need to grow is uh, of utmost importance. I also think as a whole I've had to do a bit of re-socializing re many in my class back to the expectations of an in-person classroom with the teacher and the school expectations, and also how to handle social issues between each other. 
And last, the balance between keeping students safe while also providing an environment where they can interact and get back to a sense of normalcy is also the last thing that can be kind of tricky that we're working on. What we're still working on is having our students um, social, uh, have social interaction with one another. Um, we're working on that social emotional piece and um, we had a wonderful training over the summer uh, with our leader and me and I believe that program is really helping our students um, transition back into in person. Um, so being able to have them share and take turns and work with each other, each other in group work, our partners or um, sit on the carpet or coming into small group while um, other students are quietly doing their um, centers or rotations during reading. So we're working on um, transitioning them back from virtual and hybrid and back into this in-person setting. We're also working on um, having our wonderful parent volunteers come back into the school building safely. Um, before the pandemic, uh, we had wonderful families that would come into the school to help us um, with anything that we would need or the students would need, or even just um, school events that we had so much fun doing. So hopefully um, we will figure out this year how to safely um, bring those back into our school year. Um, and we're also just working on um, figuring out new and exciting ways that we can um, address new things that pop up that did not happen before the pandemic. Um, things that we're, um, that we're trying to um, catch up on with those learning interruptions that um, since we only had those half days on Wednesdays, it, we want to catch up on that time and we're learning how to um, incorporate different strategies and different um, ways to um, incorporate the learning that uh, they might need to revisit from last year. Thank you. Um, so at this time, I'd like to ask our parent, uh, Mr. Krishnan, to uh, share his perspective from, we talked a little bit about it and what we were gonna be doing. And then we'll finish up with his son. Um, I just wanna send out, uh, just say that Mr. Krishnan is a parent that he exemplifies Jones Lake. As, so as soon as I was asked to find a parent, I went directly to him. I knew he would be more than willing. His story is one of, um, courage and a little bit of sadness. We had a loss in his family, but he has been with us and so, so supportive. And um, those uh, PTA Tuesdays I told you about that we partnered with, I think he was at every single one also. So without further ado, I'd like to send it over to Mr. Krishnan. He has um, a part to say, and then we'll finish up with his son and our video of who we are very quickly. Go with Mr. Krishnan. It's a thank you so much, Dr. Sample. Um, I, I truly appreciate this. And again, thank you so much to the um, MCPS Board of Education for this opportunity. Um, uh, a couple of things. Um, I balance two things. Um, balance being a single parent of um, two boys, um, one currently in sixth grade at Ridgeview Middle School and um, one, um, the little one who you will see soon um, at second grade at um, Jones Lane Elementary School. And as Dr. Sample said, um, when Arjun, my older one was in first grade, my wife unexpectedly passed away and I cannot even begin to um, say the, the reason we are still here is, is because of the Jones Lane Elementary School um, teachers, community, and, and the support we have received. Um, maybe you have seen the video um, the county put together on Arjun um, uh, about his book um, that he, he was, he's a published author um, as one of the Barnes and Noble, um, um, uh, uh, one of the 15 out of 15,000 kids who wrote a story about his mother, um, Susan Kennedy, um, did that for Montgomery County, um, um, and, 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 uh, uh, with a wonderful message from, uh, Mr. Craig Rice as well. Um, but that's not, that's not, it is, uh, the, the, uh, I am really thankful. I, I just cannot even begin to say that, but, um, staying on topic first, I wanted to give a shout out to, to, um, 
uh, so yes, as, as a parenting single um, parent of Arjun and Arya, but also I work as the chief science strategist uh, for the Henry Jackson Foundation for Advancement of Military Medicine. Um, so um, that is my, I, I call that a hobby and parenting, you know, is my full-time job. Um, I definitely want to shout out, um, given that I sit on this dining table and I've spent several days um, across each other of Arya and me um, from kindergarten marking period for Zoom. And now um, I do I do miss him. Um, I have to say that I do miss him. I do miss those little voices, but I'm so glad they're back in school. The first thing I want to say um, on this particular topic is I want to shout out to the, the MCPS technology people. I mean, I cannot imagine the number of Zoom, uh, Chromebook devices given out um, uh, it, almost no day without Zoom glitches. Oh my God, I have, I've been th through this whole journey with this and I cannot, thank you, thank you, thank you. That was just brilliant. I, I got to say that. Um, and then the second thing is um, food security. Oh my goodness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for to the MCPS for providing that food security to all the uh, families who were, who, who were, con who were struggling. Uh, again, that's my thank you. In terms of what we did, um, what the kids missed, my I all, all I want to do is echo Miss Vinegar's sentiment: social interaction. I mean, imagine kindergartners sitting in front of Zoom. Um, you know, it, it was hard. It was hard for them. It was hard for the teachers. It was hard for the administrators. It was hard for the parents. It was hard for everybody. And I think that was what was missing. And and um, as you might see on the video, um, the it, 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 Arya, if you ask Arya, what did he miss? He'd say one thing, recess, monkey bars, Betsy. That was what it is. I mean, of course, he learned his math. Of course, he learned his English. Of course, he learned his thing. But spending recess with, in the monkey bars, with Betsy and having coming home with you know scale you know things on his warts on his hand, that is the most important thing. And Miss Vinegar said it so beautifully. Um, the one of the things um, I think Dr. Sample said again so wonderfully as in how did we manage to keep the traditions going? And as soon as she said the um, um, talked about Jones Lane Elementary School, the year early year like no other. I wanted to quickly go and and get the book. So this is how it was. Um, this is how the the, the it's a memory book created um, by them. It was called the Jones Lane Elementary School, and and one of one of the fifth graders actually drew this um, um, jaguar. We are the jaguars, and if you look inside. I mean, one of the things which makes, I think everybody all, uh, do a awe moment is this, kindergarten pictures of the kids. All, all the four kindergartens, this is the 2015 class um, of kindergarten kids who are now, um, I want to joke, um, huge, um, because my son is at least five foot one and 100 and 105 pounds. He's like a middle school titan now. Um, and you can see that the tiny, one tiny thing climbed on the bus. Um, and one of the tiny things over here was that um, celebrating um, Halloween and Valentine's Day. Come on, how much more cuter can you get Valentine's Day in the school? Um, so putting together this memory book for, um, and again, at the back, a lot of drawings by the kids, putting together this memory book for the parents, for the teachers, for the kids was one of the best things as we as as so much of you guys have echoed the sentiment of keeping traditions and and I love it and I cannot um thank um the school enough for that um again a big shout out to um Miss Vinegar and Mr Robinson who are on the video again amazing amazing educators um and I would end by saying uh, this is my philosophy um I, I've been in this country for 25 years but I did my K through 12 in India and my philosophy, how we were brought out, is exemplified by one of our Sanskrit verses, which says, Acharya Devo Bhava. Acharya Devo Bhava means honor thy teachers. So that's what I try to tell my kids. Teachers are the most important thing. So what, do, what, can, what can I do as a parent and what I would request um, you all do as an administrator is empower the teachers. We are here as parents and administrators to empower the teachers and they will take care of the students. Um, so that, that would be all again. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I truly appreciate it over. Happy to take any questions actually.
Thank you so much, Mr. Krishnan. And so at this time, we're going to hear from his son. The there one we one of his sons, Arjun, is now in middle school. He was with us last year, and this is Arya, and he's a second grader. And then we are finished, and we will share just our our who we are video. It's a very short video. Go. Good morning. Can you tell us your name and your grade? Yes, my name is Arya Krishnan and I'm in second grade. Thank you. We have a few questions we're going to ask you. Are you ready? Yeah. Can you tell us how you felt about learning virtually from home last year? I enjoyed it. No, I was fine with it, but I did not enjoy it. My first grade teacher, Miss Papier, was great with the kids on Zoom. Thank you. What did you miss most about not being in the school building? Recess and playing with my friends, especially doing the monkey bars with Betsy. Nice. How do you feel now that you're back in the building? I'm so excited. And in my class with all my friends and my teacher, Ms. Chaturvedi. Anything else you want to add? Any favorite subjects? My favorite subjects art, and I really enjoy having a, a class with Ms. Chaturvedi. Okay, is there something we used to do as a school before the pandemic that you wish we would do again? The back to school picnic and drag fest. And every week the parents came to the classroom. Awesome. Anything else you want to share with us? The JLSC teachers are awesome and I love being at this school. Thank you so much for answering our questions. You did a great job. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Aria. I just wanted to, you all may know, notice that he was wearing his mask. He is a good rule follower. We were outside. We did all of the tapings outside and we said, Aria, we're far away from you and we're wearing our mask. Do you want to take yours off? And he said, no, I'm going to keep it on. So he's a good rule follower. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you for your time. Hopefully we didn't run over too much. I realize I want to be respectful of my colleagues. So we're all finished and we just have a, a, a little snippet of who we are, a uh, little collection, um, if we have time to show that. Thank you for, for your time. Thank you, Mr. Krishnan.
Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for uh, listening to our story. Uh, we appreciate you. And again, this is who we are, a wonderful, culturally diverse community of learners and families. Thank you very much. Thank you again so much. Um, I truly appreciate it. Um, would it be okay if I excuse myself and 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 go to? <laughs> um, yes. Thank you again. I truly, thank I you. really appreciate this opportunity. And please feel free to reach out. Um, uh, uh, yes, um, my, my kids are. We are very thankful to you. Over. Before you leave, Mr. Krishnan, we just want to say thank you for coming here today and for sharing your story. Your son was so lovely and so sweet. I loved his mask. But um, I just just know that you will continue to be in our thoughts and prayers. And I appreciate that you found a home in Johns Lane Elementary School. I just wanted to say that to you. Um, just thank you for all your work that you've done. And um, thank you. That's, that's what I'll say. I won't keep you. I know you have to go, but we appreciate yeah. No, thank you. And um, I would definitely recommend you picking up the book. Um, I can send more copies. This is where this is the book and this is his story. It's my mom's flan. Um, I recommend watching the video because that really tells the, the you should feel an immense pride. MCPS and, and your, you should feel immense pride that these are the kids you are raising. The community is raising these kids. So read that story. You it'll it'll resonate to you over. We will look into it. Thank you so much. And Dr. Sample, thank you. Um, you know, it's not about time. We really want to be able to hear from our principals. I'm so glad that we did it in a way where we can hear from our parents as well as our teachers. It's really important for our community to hear how um, our school system has been impacted, right? And we know that we ask you all to pivot on a daily basis, but you all are doing just yeoman's work and we just wanted to acknowledge that. I, I'm sure I'm going to exhaust the word thank you today. Um, but you just really put a lot of things into context, I hope, for our community. Um, and hearing from Ms. Whitaker, Mr. Robinson, about what you were able to do, right, um, in spite of the school system going virtually, um, and then what the challenges were, and um, how you figured things out was just amazing. Right, so I really appreciate um, all the stories that were shared. Um, I know technology was hard. I know for elementary students in particular, it's just different to engage in a virtual world. And so we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge that there was a learning loss, right? But I appreciate that your staff acknowledged knowing their students, knowing where they need to be and working to help get them there. So I won't take up all the time. I know we have more to hear from, but I wanted to ask my colleagues if you wanted to make a comment or just say anything to Dr. Sample, to Mr. Krishnan before he he leaves. Um, I just want to give you that opportunity, Mrs. Mondrowski. But you don't have to. I mean, but I just wanted to make certain. Yeah, no, I don't really have anything other than just to say thank you for your time and for uh, talking to us about what you all are doing. Um, looks like some fun and exciting stuff. And, um, you know, we're always very appreciative of everything that our staff does to try and continue to make sure that our students are fully engaged in school, regardless of what the situation is, whether it's virtual or in person or through a pandemic. Um, and it's always very challenging. And as uh, Ms. Evans mentioned, there's a lot of been a lot of pivoting and trying to figure things out, um, you know, build the plane as we fly type of thing. So um, I just, again, thank you very much for, for everything that you all do. Thank you both so much. We are much appreciative. Um, and Mr. Krishna, thank you. And we'll talk to you soon. It's the best for Dr. Sample, I just want to say um, thank you for a wonderful presentation. I, I see that you put a lot of time and effort in giving us so many different perspectives from parents to teachers to students. So kudos to you. That was a, a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Silvestri. Now I will go into uh, and wait for to watch my other colleagues. Yes. Thank you very much. Dr. Sam, I did um, also acknowledge thanking you for thanking transportation. I don't know that you really realize how hard transportation worked during the pandemic. Yes. It continued to work really hard. And so we're experiencing um, shortages with bus drivers, and they are still managing to do more than one route. Yes. And we've heard from many parents about 
buses arriving late. And um, mm-hmm. so we just want to tell our parents to hold on, hang tight, that um, mm-hmm. the Watkins is continuing to work to make sure that um, we get every route staffed. And we are working really hard in OHRD, that's our Office of Human Resources and Development, to make certain that we're trying to hire more bus drivers. So but just thank you for acknowledging them. Yeah. And I'm Thank not you so much. I was working hard, but um, right now it's a lot going on with transportation. So just thank you. Mm-hmm. So with that, I will turn it over to um, you. Have a good rest of your day. And I will turn it over to Mr. Cram to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Uh, we're going to let Mr. Davis do that. He's very keenly aware of the great story that Principal Staten is going to share. And I believe, uh, Mr. Davis, you were a middle school principal, right? So you understand very well connecting to that in-between uh, set of grades. Yeah, uh, I absolutely do. Some of the fondest uh, memories. And I also have, have raised a middle schooler. So I've been on both sides <laughs> of the aisle, so to speak. So it is a pleasure and an honor. First, thank you again to, uh, to Dr. Sample and the Jones Lane community. Uh, I, it is an honor to introduce Mr. Staten, who is the principal of Julius West Middle School. And without further ado, I'll let him share a little bit about his experiences. Thank you for being here. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And uh, I see a lot of familiar faces. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to be back um, with, with some of you again. Um, I have two uh, guests uh, from Julius West, uh, a resource counselor, uh, Ms. Janet Lehus, and Ms. Amy Rivas, who's a uh, classroom teacher um, slash uh, family liaison. And then we have about three short videos to show you. Um, so first and foremost, I, I, I love this topic. Um, when, when Chris reached out to me um, and, and mentioned community, um, this was just um, music to my ears because I, I, this is my favorite part about being a principal um, and engaging the community. And, and so I'm going to really enter this from, from that angle and that standpoint. We've talked a lot about, I've heard Dr. Sample did a great job in, with her staff and really outlining a lot of the instructional um, uh, adjustments and, and, and instructional losses there were. We're going to touch on that a little bit, but that, I believe that's been well documented, particularly some of the learning loss. And I'm going to highlight um, what I thought was um, and still think was the most important part about um, living through this pandemic um, over the last 18, 19 months. And, and it starts with the community and it starts actually with um, the student well-being team. And I'm so glad that we actually changed that name. Uh, we used to call, I think different schools called it something, you know, they had a different term, coordinated services, support services team. Um, student well-being team is um, the perfect title for um, of the group of people who serve a community. And talk about just real quick about the loss. The loss, anytime you lose in-person contact with kids and families, that's a significant loss in a school. And I'll, I'll be the first to tell you, there's no fun being a principal when there's no one in the building. And so that was, that was even personally lost for me. And um, so we had to quickly, just to give you a quick timeline of that, that time period, um, we had to quickly move into action with our student well-being team to, to figure out how are we gonna stay engaged with our community? And we didn't know how long this would last at the time, but we knew most importantly, we started to quickly lose contact with kids and families in, in that initial shutdown period. As we moved into the summer, we, um, as we moved into the summer, excuse me. Sorry about that, I had a visitor, <laughs> a student. <laughs> Um, our student well-being team was really pivotal, and um, and I shared some some experiences or some events with Everett um, back. If you remember uh, the summer of 20, 2020, Everett, when we were doing a lot of our community outreach with produce distributions, and I thank uh, thank uh, Marla Kaplan for being such a uh, a great partner and collaborator with us. We were able to 
do um, uh, weekly produce distributions throughout the entire year, 2020 through 2021. We averaged um, 150 to 200 families per week coming through the building, uh, through the uh, parking lot area. And that was one way we were able to engage um, our community. I'm going to share a, a blog I wrote in February. You don't have to read it right now, but it really um, highlights and captures that, that experience of community outreach um, during a pandemic. And I don't have a, a, a video to show at the end of, of who we are, but I think this blog at least gives you a sample of, of what that time period was like uh, for us with families. And so as we moved into the school year, the virtual uh, school year, there was a lot of loss. And I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Uh, Janet Lehus to talk about some of the loss and some of what we were able to recover um, during the 2021 school year. And we're going to really focus on um, two events that we had recently that were sort of traditional but non-traditional, ways in which we, we um, pivoted to um, start this school year uh, with reaching out to our community. Um, that was, that was non-traditional, but let's, let's recap last year in terms of what was lost and what, some, what were some of the things we were able to do. Janet? Thank you so much for, for letting me share. So um, I'm the resource counselor at Julius West. And overall, I mean, the, the personal connection and that feedback from teachers and peers was critical. That was so hard for people to engage and have that connection when they were only on this small little screen. And one of the first things that teachers said in the week back this fall was, I, there, it's not a black screen. It's somebody that I can talk to. It's somebody that I'm so excited to have them here and engaging with us. So um, that is a huge loss that we're still really working hard to, um, to strengthen right now. Um, obviously, the social, emotional and peer connections was was really um, so important and obviously in middle school. But um, our kids were are, are clamoring to have more of that. And I think some of them are missing a little bit of that half an hour they had when they had the longer lunch. Um, because they got to develop some of those friendships with a lot of adult support, because um, we, in essence, have two sixth grader groups that kids hadn't met each other at all. Um, and so a lot of fostering, encouraging of that socialization while we did some walks and did some outside time. So we're still working on that now. And the fact that we have three lunch areas is wonderful, because so it's a little more intimate, a little bit more supportive for them. Um, staff helping with that. Um, and we're going to continue with uh, several um, partnerships with the PTSA to help strengthen that social piece. But I think the overall in middle school, that's one of the biggest things the kids would tell you is the loss of that time with friends, making those friendships, growing as a person. So we've worked a lot on identity and helping the kids kind of share that and learn about each other um, in the start of our school year. And then the other big piece is really that routine and structure. This changes from last year to this year. It's, it's a lot for the kids to get back in that routine. I have a high schooler and he says the same thing. Um, his first year of high school was very different. And now it's back to this start time, these, this bell schedule, this kind of um, expectation. So we're working a lot with the kids to help um, develop that and really help them um, know that this is healthy um, and that, you know, being able to do kind of whatever they wanted to do whenever before when they were all virtual. Um, it, we want to help each other support and grow in every way we can academically and socially. Um, thank you, Ms. Lehus. One of the big um, things that we discovered um, in I'm staying in last year a little bit longer is how much in need our families were, how much they were struggling during the pandemic. Um, phone call after phone call, visit after visit, drive-by visit after drive-by visit. We realized that there was a lot of, um, there was some suffering, there was some um, significant challenges. And one of the things that I, that I love about this community and why community is so important is that um, we came together during that time period. In addition to some of the weekly uh, produce distributions we were doing, um, there were uh, uh, multiple uh, gift card drives. 
Um, we raised um, several thousand dollars and, and, and students participated in some of those um, holiday gift giveaways. They prepared baskets, they pre prepared Thanksgiving um, sort of uh, gift bags. Uh, I think at the bottom of uh, that blog, there's a photo of, of some of that, um, of an image of one of those. And so during that, that time period, it was, we knew that there was learning loss. But we also knew how important and vital keeping the community get together was going to be because that was going to help us transition back to any kind of in-person learning. So as we moved back to hybrid last spring, mm -hmm. um, we, we didn't have as many lost connections as we would have had we not done some of the community outreach. And it really, I want to give, I really want to elevate our student well-being team because there were countless hours um, well into the evening where we're tracking down kids and families and checking in on their well-being and checking in on assignments that, that have not com been completed and really trying to keep kids um, academically eligible, even though there was no real eligibility um, for any particular sports. And so um, a lot of the work we did last year was, was really community-based um, and, and knowing that we were gonna have some learning loss. Fast forward into this summer, we met, um, um, back up just a minute, um, we met throughout the summer of 2020 as a student well-being team. We did not stop meeting, we did not stop planning um, for what we needed to work ahead of us. Fast forward to this past summer, same thing occurred. We knew we were um, going to be um, in person. And so we, be, we met throughout the summer as a student well-being team, and we planned for that transition. Um, and so one of the things that I wanna highlight now is, um, I heard Ms., uh, Mrs. Silvestri bring up um, you know, the bilingual community. And that's, that's a big uh, part of Julius West. 28% of our um, population is Hispanic. We have um, uh, roughly 15 to 20% that's, uh, that's Spanish speaking in the home. And um, the Twinbrook community is one of our um, areas uh, that make up about a quarter of our population. And so this past summer, we planned um, to do some outreach in that community to help those families and those students trans transition back. I, um, I've been at Julius West for uh, several years. Um, I was an AP here before becoming a principal. So I, I do know the community pretty thoroughly. And I'm gonna let Ms. Rivas talk about um, the Twinbrook event. And um, we're gonna hear from a student, I believe, about his reflections um, from that event. And, and I believe another teacher uh, but Ms. Rivas was instrumental in planning that event. And this just happened um, September 9th, I believe. Ms. Rivas. Thank you, Mr. Satan. Yeah, so we, um, with the student well-being team, we kind of partner up with um, more teachers and more volunteers um, to, to put this event together. We felt that it was very important um, to do an in-person um, information night for, for our community. Um, so I can just share some pictures of how that night went. Um, very, um, very active, um, good turnout with the parents. Um, we also had student volunteers um, that came out for us um, to help us with um, informational tables that we had. Um, we had tables where um, Parents can check in if their child is up to with the vaccinations, information on um, how they can access their grades. Um, we have to have parent view. Um, we had a counseling table if they had any questions about mental health um, or even classes, just general classes um, for, their, for their child. Uh, we also had more information about extracurricular activities, trying to get that community really involved in extracurricular um, after school activities so that they can um, have that interaction with, with each other. We, we felt that um, it's very important for them to, to really interact with one another um, 
outside of school. So letting them know what is available at our school. Um, I believe we also had um, a parent feedback table too. We also wanted to know what we can do as a school to better um, inform them or better um, educate parents on how to help their student or how to um, be even better parents. Um, so we, we definitely got their feedback um, to, to make sure that we were serving them. We wanted to know how we can serve them. So um, that table is very important to us. We had a, a great turnout for that as well. Um, so we did, uh, our, our student volunteer actually helped us with that. And he personally went out to parents to talk to them and, and ask them these questions because some parents couldn't fill out the surveys. So we're gonna see a video here uh, where our student Melvin, um, what he enjoyed from that night, what he got out of it. And um, and yeah, that's that's about it. Hey, my name is Melvin. I'm an eighth grader at Julius West Middle School. Hi Melvin, who did you attend homework night with? I attended with my mom. Okay, and why did you attend? Uh, we attended because we were looking how to contact my teachers and how to check my grades from home. Okay, was the information useful? I mean, yeah, it was, because like, now she knows how to email my teachers and check my grades and how I'm doing in school. Good, good. And, and what did you do there besides attend? I was, she went out to teachers and asked how I was doing at school. And she, I think she asked all the teachers for help and more stuff. Okay, and what did you do at the event? Uh, I was helping parents filling out this few papers and explaining them what it was about and what they had to do on the paper. And what did you enjoy from that night? I enjoyed almost everything because it was my first time talking to parents and not feeling like shy, awkward. So it was really nice, to be honest. Good, thank you. Um, before we hear from the teacher, um, the, the reason why this um, night was important to us, you saw some of the images. When we planned this in the summer, we did not know that um, back to school night was gonna be virtual. At the time of planning this event, everything was in person. So when back to school night switched to the traditional back to school night switched to virtual, um, we always collect data. Um, you know, some of it's observational, um, some of it's through uh, surveys and forms. Um, we realized that the virtual back to school night did not serve all of our communities. That was the reality. And it really um, strengthened our, our need and our focus to, to make sure this event happened. Um, we, we, we only, I say only, which I think is still a good number, we had about 60 families come out. Um, and it was very important for us to have an in-person experience with um, the Twinbrook community. Um, we feel that, and in, in, in just in past years and working with different communities in, in the Rockville area, some of the feedback we've gotten is um, they like when we come out to them. Um, it's very hard for families sometimes to, um, you know, get to school, to a school event, even though this year was virtual, so that didn't really matter, um, you know, at five, six, seven o'clock because they're, um, you know, they have home duties. And so we realized that the virtual event, while it was very successful um, and we're happy with the, the way we planned it and delivered it, it did not serve everyone. And so what you're gonna hear from a teacher is in this next video is uh, the feedback. Um, we had a feedback station where we dialogued with parents about their experience that night and what they hope to gain from, um, the support from Julius West. And this book I'm showing, if you can see it, called Street Data. I don't think you can see it that well. Um, this is a book our leadership team read. Um, and some of the, the, the work um, 
the content of the book centers around the listening leader and um, going out to the Twinbrook community and working with all of our communities. One of our focus areas this year is to be more of, of a listening leadership team where we listen to members of the community and, and act on some of their feedback. So the next video is from one of our teachers at the event, Ms. Martinez. Hi, Ms. Martinez, how was your experience at the Twinborough Community Night? Hello, um, the Twinborough Community Night was a really nice experience. Uh, we had both English and Spanish speakers coming, but the majority Spanish speakers. We had a lot of faculty there who spoke both languages, and we had some interpreters there as well. Um, and the event overall was a huge success. Good, and who did you work with? So I worked at the feedback table. So we were asking uh, parents what was, you know, what is, what are some things that Julius West can do to improve? Um, what are some things that they think, you know, that might still be needed um, for that community? Um, and we got some really, some really interesting answers, such as, um, what are the plans for COVID? If my student gets sick, what's the plan? Um, Things like there should be events for the parents to get to know each other, you know, kind of come as a community that have students at the same school um, and others. <laughs> got it. Yeah. Did you feel like this event was really useful? Yeah, I think the event was very useful. Um, I think the parents left. Uh, we also heard from some parents who really just really enjoyed that night. They felt like they got to meet members from the community that they hadn't, you know, gotten to see in a year and a half due to COVID. They felt like some resources that they were looking for, you know, were fulfilled. They were also introduced to some of the clubs that we have at our school. Um, that you know, maybe they didn't know about before that their students can get involved in after school. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Martina. Thank you. So that was uh, one example, a uh, highlight of a, a recent event that we did to engage one of our, um, our communities in, in a, in a non-traditional way. Um, we've done events like that before in, in Twinbrook and in Lincoln Park and other communities, but never really this early in the school year. And it was because of the, the COVID uh, uh, protocols and the pandemic, the, the need for it um, uh, was that we had to do it early. We had to do it at the beginning of the year. So the theme of this is around how, how does our, our school engage the community? And so we had another um, event um, it, uh, last Thursday evening called our uh, Fall Fest. This is actually a traditional event that we've had. Um, it's, it happens very early in the school year. And we typically maybe get about 100. We, get, we, we typically get about 100 kids. <laughs> yes, it's school. I'm waving people out. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, we typically get about 100 students coming out. And a lot of it is indoors. Um, and uh, because of the protocols, we, we wanted to make sure we kept this event and we, uh, we did it all outdoors. And so the reason for that is another way for us to bring the community together so that we could uh, hopefully help people transition back to in-person. And unbelievably, we had um, over 500 tickets sold. This was uh, something sponsored by the PTSA. If you've been to Julius West, our, um, our entire um, um, athletic facility, our fields are, are massive for middle school. Um, and since Amy shared, I, I am gonna share screen in a moment. Just, oh, you have it, thank you. Um, here are some of the, uh, just some of the images from that evening. We had a photo booth. We did some, a little bit indoors with um, uh, table tennis. This was the outdoor space that we used. We're gonna have a parent share in a moment some of her reflections um, around this evening. Um, actually, let's just, let's just hear from her. Um, the, we did some do dodge, well, we kept the numbers indoors uh, smaller and students were masked and then outdoors um, it was, um, you, you can't see all of it, but there's uh, soccer games going on to the right. Um, the, we had the lights on, but let's hear from Mrs. Swibel. She's our last 
um, uh, person. Hi, my name is Beth Swibel, and I'm the VP of events at Julius West Middle School. We just had an extremely successful Fall Fest last night. It was the first time in two years that our students got together to do something fun outdoors in a safe way. It was an incredible experience for our students who had not had any sort of normalcy with their peers at school in a very long time. And the beauty of this event was that they not only got together in a safe way, but literally could see each other without masks on for the first time because it was outside. So we were so grateful to do this and we were so grateful that the kids finally got together as a community and it strengthened our sense of belonging so much. Um, so again, those those are two um, recent events that we've we've had that were somewhat non-traditional and and really brought the community together, and you know it 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 covers one aspect of what our challenges are ahead are, and and I'll sort of close with a few points here. Um, so on the one hand, we want that social emotional engagement. We want to reconnect with people. We want to be able to have conversations, to, to talk like we um, have normally talked in, in pre-COVID, right? Um, so we're, we've accomplished that in, a, in, in some ways here at the beginning of the year. But the challenges ahead are, are these. And, and Ms. Lihus uh, touched on them a little bit earlier. Um, we are seeing that kids are still not normalized to school routines okay so when you when you when people drive by school they see the buses running they drop off the kids in front of school and um their kids are going in with their backpacks and it seems like things are normal and for the most part they are everybody's in class but um the attention span <laughs> of students has really dwindled significantly because at the time of, of their growth, 10, 11, 12, 13 years of age, they stopped having certain routines for 18 months. And so we're seeing the effects of that right now. And so it's gonna, one of our challenges ahead is that, you know, it's gonna take some time for us to see kids um, normalize to routines. Um, I think we've done a good job at this school with bringing the community together and 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 help having people feel a sense of social engagement. But on the academic side of things, um, it's, it is going to take a little bit of time because kids are not we're seeing more kids needing to go to the bathroom. They're just not used to sitting for long periods of time. Um, and it's a challenge ahead. We are grateful for some of the uh, COVID upgrades um, in, in the form of rapid testing, the asymptomatic testing, um, those things have really helped to reduce the, the goal was to reduce the quarantining. And we're seeing the effects of that right now, um, as of today. Um, we're seeing where um, kids don't have to quarantine, one, if they're vaccinated, two, if um, it, the other issue is if they're, um, have symptoms, uh, they can be rapidly tested and we can we can assess whether or not they uh, other kids need to quarantine around them. That's a, that's a big change in a two week period. Um, and then the academic side is going to it's going to take some time for us to really um, settle kids down into normal routines so that they they can sit for longer periods of time and digest the learning in a traditional way. Um, so those are our challenges, but um, I'm really proud of our work and um, grateful for this opportunity for you uh, to hear us uh, share some of what we've done. Thank you so much. I just I really appreciate this conversation that we're having today. I think it's so important for everybody in our community to hear and see what it looks like to go to school and it's not the same and um, just thank you to everybody that's come on today Miss Lehus, um, Miss Rivas, 
Principal Stanton. Um, we hear so much about Julius West because Miss um, Webb um, has a daughter there, all great things. And um, hearing from the student Melvin and Miss Swibel, and I think I missed someone, but I think it's really important for people to know. I you touched on a couple of things. You talked about you never stop working even throughout the summer, right? To continue to make sure that as there, as we were returning to school and we all had imagined that it was gonna be in person, which it is, but not knowing that we would be up against the Delta variant, that there have been a lot of things that have immediately changed, like a lot of plans change and, it, and it's not as easy as people think. And I know the board gets, a, we get a ton of emails where people are making some assumptions that are just not accurate and having you on here talking about what that work looks like um although it's a challenge that people are willingly doing it um and not only that that you're thinking about the social emotional piece to it and what resources that our parents need i don't know that everybody in every community was impacted but there were some families that lost jobs they had food insecurity and so um thank you for mentioning uh, miss marlin Kaplan, um, the work that she did and other partners did to make certain that food was put in people's um, on their tables, right? You mentioned 150 to 200 families coming to your school, Julius West, every week for 18 months. We gave out over 12 million meals. I don't think people really realize that that's a lot, right? And so um, in spite of it all, you all have continued to do yeoman's work, knocking on doors, going to check on families to see how they are, knowing that's really important. And thank you for highlighting what you all are doing for our families that um, English is not their first language, that you are being thoughtful, that you are, that you are translating and making certain that families get that information in the language they can understand it in. Um, so I, I just... I just want to say thank you, right? And um, coming here today and putting things in context for people is, is, is helpful for us as board members, right? We hear the stories, but just to see the people, to put um, faces to um, family members, to teachers who are um, coming in, figuring out technology in a way that they didn't even think that they would have to. Um, so I won't continue to go on, but I could. And so this was just a really important conversation that we're having today. I'm glad we had it. I'm glad everybody shared. I'm glad people were vulnerable and just told the story the way that it was. And um, so we will continue to um, do all we can to make certain that we're supportive of our administrators, our teachers, our students, and our families. And so we'll say to our partners, continue to help us because we, we do need your help. And I don't know if my colleagues have any comments that they want to share, anything that they want to say, but wanted to give them an opportunity. I'll start with um, Vice President Silvestri. Is there anything you wanted to say? And if not, we can go on because we do have another presentation before we end our meeting, but please. Um, just quickly, I did want to um, commend you on your emphasis on getting feedback. I think it's so important to ensure that what we're doing is working for our families. I think sometimes we assume that because it works for us, it works for everyone. But so I really appreciate hearing that. And um, what are you hearing from your families in terms of parent view? Um, I just got an email saying that an assignment was graded and she got 10 out of 10. Great. Um, but, um, you know, what... Um, what more could we be doing so that it's more accessible to families? And then the use of email. I, I'm on email all the time, but I know a lot of our families are not. Just wanted to get your perspective on those two issues. Janet, did you want to go? Um, that was a big part of our night at Twin Group. Yes, it was. And so many are just looking over the shoulder of their child to see what's there and not being able to access it, access it themselves. So. We had a, a good number of families that we were able to help with that physically right then, because unfortunately just sending directions often doesn't help enough. Um, we are finding a lot of families are preferring like a WhatsApp connection so that it's, you know, that, that email connection or that connected call, they're not always receiving or, or reading that because sometimes there's a lot um, that's coming at them. So 
um, you know, that would be a good takeaway for us to try and, and, and kind of strengthen that more um, is, is that connection. Um, I think every, you know, certainly everybody at the Turnbrook Night is anxious to, to know more. And I know we're heading into the high school choice process. So we do want to make sure our effort is going to make sure we reach out to all this families and students to make sure they know that process and they can access things because it is very much connected to the parent view. So we're hoping we have even more parents um, working with us to, to have that access. And um, to add to that, we're hoping to overcome um, some of the communication barriers by doing more um, in-person events in the community. So mm -hmm. I think that's what we could be doing more of. And so we plan to do at least quarterly um, this, there's a lot of big topics that come up throughout the year. Articulation. How do I register for, for courses and classes and what do they mean? And what, which one should my kid be in? What math should, you know, and some of that gets lost in, um, I do a weekly newsletter and it's all spelled out and it's, you know, bilingual, <laughs> but people need that in-person touch. Mm -hmm. So more, more, more frequent in-person, um, opportunities. And we're fortunate we have a good partnership with the Twin Rope Community Center. So at least for that outreach, we we can hopefully continue that through the year. Thank you. And I did write down that book you you shared, The Street Data. I think that is really important that um, our leaders, our listeners. So thank you for acknowledging what you all have done to make sure that you're listening to your community. And to your point earlier about kids having to be normalized to the school routines, just this morning, taking my daughter to the bus stop, she talked about, you know, she's an athlete, she's in IV, and she said, I, I wish it was just for a day, virtual learning, so I could just get a little bit of rest. So I think the kids are like getting that routine and getting back into it um, is not as easy. And I don't know if we're all thinking about that. So until she said that, until she verbalized that out loud, I hadn't even thought how difficult it was of a transition because for more than 18 months, um, our students were virtual. And me too. I wish I had today. To... <laughs> um, but I would be remiss. I'm sorry if I didn't acknowledge Margarita. She has been a, had a significant impact on the Julius West community for so long um, in our ESOL population, our ESOL programming at Julius West and in the Rockville area. Um, any any uh, human resources that we need um, to make sure that we're connecting with that population. Um, so Margarita, I just I had to say that publicly. Sure, thank you. And then to our, um, to our, our our uh, central office folks, the, the thing that I always say is I, I love it when you bring great examples to the board, but it's about taking it countywide. So um, this is this is not, I don't expect you to answer this, but just let's um, continue to develop best practices that can be shared with all principals. Some, some know how to do this very well and some others need help, and so they shouldn't have to um, reinvent the wheel uh, when we know we have uh, good practices already happening in the county. And I didn't um, forget about Mrs. Mondrowski. I wanted to make sure if you had a comment you wanted to make that you did do that. Thank you. Yeah, I'll be really quick. Um, I, most of what I had on my um, sheet here has been addressed um, to specific things being the, uh, the feedback and making sure that we're getting that. And the fact that I'm very appreciative of the action that you're taking based on what you're hearing from your families directly, um, because it is important that we're addressing what is important to them, not just what we think should be important or is important. Um, and, um, you know, I too, you know, constantly saying these presentations are great, um, having had two kids in, totally, completely different pathways through their educational experiences, one through um, the Gaithersburg cluster, one through the Quince Orchard cluster. And, you know, we, we get fabulous presentations and then, but I would sit there and say, well, that, that's not happening, you know, where, where my child is this year or whatever. And so that consistency across schools and making sure that we're not trying to um, reinvent the wheel if we don't need to, and that we are supporting each other um, with some of these best practices is, is really critical. So thank you for all the work you all are doing and for the time that you took to be here with us today. 
Yes, thank you. Um, so just again, thank you to the speakers that we've had. And um, to Mrs. Blondrowski's point, I think Dr. Carroll, Dr. Sample, I'm sorry, Dr. Sample had mentioned earlier that the intention is not to reinvent the wheel and they're really good at sharing what's going on. So we appreciate that. Um, please share. I, I'm sure like during this time, it is um, really difficult. And so however, we can make it easy for everyone in the system. Um, but I, I know you all do do that. I know you collaborate and everything. So um, yeah. thank you again for the presentation. Ms. Evans, I have a quick question. I apologize. But um, the in terms of the collaboration, that it was one of the other things that I had been thinking about is, you know, with everything on all of your plates and, you know, particularly as principals um, and administrative people, there's so much more on everyone's plates now than there ever has been. Certainly, at least that's how it seems. And um, and I know everybody stretched thin. How are you finding time to um, collaborate with your across the cluster with you know with your elementary school leadership and your high school leadership? And you talked briefly about you know the articulation process and everything, and just making sure that you know we're keeping those connections um, going and. And that, I mean, where are you finding time for all of that and how are you making that work? We have not yet. Go ahead, Carol, D Dr. Sample, go ahead. No, go ahead, please. Um, that is a, um, a, a, another big part of what, what I love to do. Um, and uh, for the, the event we did at Twinbrook, we, we, had, we, we often collaborate with Matt Devan, the principal, and, um, the staff at Twinbrook as we're working with families. Um, but you, it's a great question. And, and I, um, am, I was talking to Peter Moran the other day about this, that I'm just ready to just set up a meeting um, here in October or so to get us together to really talk about some of the things I, I, we just talked about and how we can align ourselves. Um, and so that has not happened yet because of um, I'll be honest with transitioning back and mo monitoring the protocols and um, quarantine and um, and this is not, I'm not complaining. I'm just saying that the, the the workload in the beginning of the year is always big. Getting a school off the ground at the beginning of the year is always big. The beginning and the end are huge, but this year in particular, getting it off the ground is 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 humongous. So it's in the works. And for us, uh, Mrs. Sumdrowski, we have regular Quince Orchard Cluster Principals meetings, and that's really set up. Um, we we work as as a team to set them up, but our uh, we call her our leader, our high school principals usually um, are, take the lead on it. And so there is a meeting schedule for pretty much every single month, and. We've been trying to do it at different. We were we weren't able to do it last year as well as we could. We've been trying to do it this year. At we always take someone's school. Like I would take September. Usually it's the the the, the high school that takes September. So Beth had it for uh, September, but we had to we. We had to reschedule, but someone else would take uh, October and then Rachel Carson would have November. And, uh, you know, that's we did it by months. And so we connect that way. But almost every day we're on emails with each other, just sharing ideas or if there are questions, uh, we do it informally. We do it formally and we do it informally. And then, of course, with our um, meetings with our directors, we have meetings every other uh, Friday. Last year we had it every Friday. Um, so we, there are lots of different ways. And, um, you know, also my, my colleagues, my cluster colleagues are on speed dial for me. <laughs> so we're always like, you know, saying, did you see that? Can you help me with that? You know, so we, we use each other as a resource, but we also use other principals as a resource that one of my former assistant principals is the principal of Darnstown and another one over, you know, um, at another school, I don't want to out them right now, but, but we talk to each other constantly. Um, and I tell you, a really wonderful resource has been just the, the principal's um, 
we, the, the principles, um, oh, what is it? The, we share each other's ideas on the principles list with the uh, emails. And oh my goodness, the ideas that come from there are just wonderful from principles all over the county. So we're, there are ways that we connect to be sure. But that was a great question. Because it is hard. Sometimes when you're in your building, you feel like you're all alone and you don't really you know, know where to go and how to, you know, so it, it's, it, it's, we find ways to connect for sure. Thank well, you for God. asking. Absolutely. Thank you for everything. Okay. So I do know we have one last presentation and that your first job is to be a principal. So please, if you have to turn off your video to handle business, do not say you're sorry we understand so i will let mr davis um introduce our next presenter thanks miss evans yes so we it is a pleasure now that we've heard from our elementary and middle school we'd like to offer a high school perspective now uh pleased to have with us dr mirshaw from paint branch high school and i will turn it over to her at this time so good morning, everyone. I've been sitting and listening and learning a lot and taking notes from my colleagues because we can always find good ideas from each other. And that's what I've been doing today. So thank you for that opportunity. Um, so just to put some context on it, I was appointed by the board last year. So July 1 of 2020, um, coming in as a new principal to Paint Branch and really thinking about how am I going to connect to the community during this very uh, stressful time in education. Um, they really need to know their principals, the voice of the principal is so critical in a high school and coming in new and trying to make those connections, not just with the staff and the students, but the parents and the community at large. Um, during where we were in the pandemic was a challenge. So I had to uh, think about it and be very strategic in terms of my moves last year and into this year. In terms of how do we bring the students, the parents and the community into a school, when in reality for most of the year, I was alone in the school by myself with you know one or two administrators. Um, what I will say at the high school level is I do see us as more of a community center than a high school. Um, everything in the community comes back into our buildings. And uh, parents are normally attached, not necessarily to the school at large, but to specific programs. If you are a parent of an athlete, you might be involved with that team. You might be involved with our athletic boosters. If your child is in uh, music, you might be involved with instrumental uh, boosters. Uh, you might just be involved with PTSA. So parents are in these pockets across the school. So trying to have access to all of them and being able Able to communicate with all of them really through last year and this year um, was a little bit of a challenge um, when so many of the things that would have brought them into the school were not in existence. So we didn't have our programs that they could participate in and be a part of. So that was something that we really lost last year is that sense of community. I really do see high schools as a community center and um, bringing people into the building is critical. And we lost that last year. But having lost that, um, we tried to find ways to still communicate, still to adjust and still make connections with our community. Um, Zoom was instrumental for us as it was for everyone else all through last year. What I will share is we find it to be instrumental still this year. Uh, parents are participating in IEP meetings and they may not have normally been able to do that because it's during the school day um, and it's a little bit more engaging than a phone call into the IEP meeting. Um, we have our PTSA president and the executive board decided that they were going to hold all of their PTSA meetings virtually this year because of the increased turnout that the virtual provides uh, for the PTSA. So all of our PTSA meetings per the PTSA president are going to be virtual. Um, we do have, uh, you know, we did look for opportunities to bring people into the building. That's something that's, again, important to me and part of, I think, what high schools do. So prior to um, learning that the students couldn't be in the building, so early in August, we knew that we had ninth graders and 10th graders who had never been inside the building. And high schools are big, large, intimidating spaces. We wanted our students to be able to walk in, walk around, get a sense for the facility. So we did hold an open house that was in person and our parents were invited to attend with their students. And it was extremely well received early in August. Now, of course, where we are now is in a very different place and we may not be able to do an event like that in the building. But I'm so glad that we organized it and did that in August because it gave all of our ninth graders and 10th graders 
a chance to see the facility, meet their teachers, start to build that connection with high school. Um, another thing that we did is we've been a vaccine site uh, several times, and we will continue to be a vaccine site for our community. So we have several dates coming up. I think October 9th is the next set of dates uh, where we will provide vaccines for anyone who wants to get vaccinated in this community or anyone who can drive to the school um, in partnership with some local organizations. Again, we want to be a place where there are resources for the community and a reason for them to to come in uh, when athletics started this year we normally have an athletic meeting where our um, athletic specialist meets with parents and goes over the expectations you know for fall athletics we had initially planned on doing that indoors and of course we were not going to be able to do that with where we were once school started with the delta variant but we still held the athletics meeting we just did it in the stadium uh, my athletic specialist had well over 200 parents in the bleachers and we were still able to give them the information that they needed um, for their child to be able to participate in fall sports we uh, believe in terms of the virtual that just doing the virtual on its own, um, it shouldn't be a checkbox. We really need to make it about a connection. And so that was our approach to back to school night. We knew it was gonna be virtual, but we wanted it to still make a connection and for our parents to feel like they were talking to us, seeing us, talking to their child's teachers. And so we structured our back to school night in a way that really allowed for that. We had an overview session uh, with live Q&A, and then the parents were able to go and visit each of their child's teachers. And we knew our parents you know, had to navigate jumping on one Zoom into another Zoom into another Zoom to see all seven periods. And so we created a document that I hope was very easy for them to use and understand our materials. We spend a lot of time focusing on our materials to make sure they are clear and easy for our parents to use. Um, the feedback that I've received was that the materials did help our parents and guide them through the virtual back to school night so that they could be in different spaces and talk to different people. Also recently, uh, we did have a very, very small group of parents in after hours for a financial aid workshop. Uh, this was after the school day, very, very spread out in our auditorium and I believe about 15 parents. But when you're talking about financial aid and applying for financial aid, it's just, it can't just be communicated in a newsletter. Um, I feel that sometimes with all of the information that our parents are getting, um, imagine a fire hose of information that's coming at our parents constantly with long newsletters that they cannot digest. Um, so my approach has been to really think about making things into bite-sized pieces that they can digest and understand and get the information they need as opposed to being overwhelmed. So this year, I'm really trying to be the person that edits the information um, to make sure that what my parents are getting is what they need and not every single thing that I could possibly throw at them because then it just becomes overwhelming and they're not able to get the benefit of, of knowing what's happening um, in the school or in the building. So again, for us, the sense of community is critical. I think for us, the sense of trying to hold on to as many traditions as we can while being very safe and cognizant of what we need to do in order to make sure that our building is safe for our students and our staff um, has been critical. Um, ways that we share information, uh, we make sure that our website is updated. I actually have two people who serve as webmasters, and we want to make sure that that first page, that landing page, is updated and has everything that parents need. We don't want them to have to go in and click around into different sections. So Anything that's critical is on the first page. So if they don't know where to turn and they just get on the first page of our website, they should find what they need. We do very targeted communication, as I said, short emails, not long emails, specific age groups. Uh, so if it's something that's just for ninth graders, we don't send it to everybody in the community. We just send it to the ninth grade parents. So we want to make sure that we're getting the information to the people who need it. Um, continuing to do virtual parent meetings um, and having those opportunities, uh, using social media uh, very uh, assertively um, so that parents can see what's happening in the building. There are, as you said, parents pull up in front of the school, their kids come out and they walk into the building and they don't know what's happening in the building. And there's a lot of questions about, is it the same? Is it different? So really putting things on social media so our parents can get a feel for the culture and the climate of our building is critical. Um, we also have been working on getting our families into parent view and synergy last year at the start of the school 
school year, only about 30% of our parents were on Synergy. So when you're sending those emails on Synergy, where exactly are they going? Um, this year, we're at 60 some percent, and we are working still with our community to get them online. Some parents just need a little bit more support with that technology. We're trying to figure out how exactly to do that. Our plan had been to have an in-person support session at back to school night for our parents. And so unfortunately, when we weren't able to do that in-person uh, session to really stand next to them and help them as they're clicking through, um, that fell apart. So we're still thinking about what can we do to increase that percentage. Uh, last year, our main office uh, just called parents and talked them through the process. And that's how we were able to get up to the over 60% where we are now. So that's, that's critical work that we wanna do this year. Um, some challenges that we've had, uh, language barriers, um, trying to meet the needs of our families who do not speak English as their native language. We looked at the data for Paint Branch. It's a little different than what you might think, um, but about a solid third of the school are multilingual students or have been multilingual uh, second language learners at some point. So even though they may not be in an English language learning uh, program at this time, they are multilingual. And so we just want to take that into consideration in our communication with our families. Um, we still are, you know, those last few percentages of parents that may not be as comfortable with the technology. So while many people are comfortable and they're on Synergy and they can Zoom, we are cognizant that there are parents that can't. And how do we get them that support so that they don't miss out on what's happening? Um, finally, we have a growing uh, percentage of English language learners at Paint Branch. Uh, we have welcomed ESOL level one and two students this year, which is new for our school community. Um, and really having to think about how do we approach communication with those families and those students so that they feel included in the Paint Branch community? I'm hoping to tap into my expertise as a former ESOL teacher to make that happen because I think it's really important for them to also feel uh, welcome and a part of the school community. Another challenge has been vertical articulation. You mentioned that with our middle schools and our feeder schools. Um, that is just uh, something that we're working through. And actually, my um, signature coordinator, um, Ms. Megan Tomas, is here, and she's going to speak a little bit about that process in just a moment. But that has been a challenge. Uh, prior to me coming on, I heard the conversation about how do I keep in touch with my colleagues. Um, last year, the three high school principals in the NEC, um, Blake, Springbrook, and Paint Branch, we all met every week. Uh, Tuesday mornings was a standing meeting for us all through last year. Um, this year, while we haven't started with the standing meetings, uh, we communicate very regularly, email, phone, text. Um, I met a parent this morning that has a child at Blake, has a child at Springbrook, and has a child at Paint Branch. So it is really critical for us to be able to be on the same page for the parents that really share our schools. I'm also in communication with my two largest feeders, um, Banneker and Briggs Cheney, and their amazing principals. So we, we have uh, learned a lot in terms of how to include our parents in a virtual setting, ways to use our building safely um, as still a, a hub of the community. Um, sports are back outside, um, and so it's wonderful to see Friday night lights again with our community showing up. Um, and it's been wonderful to, to really welcome the students back to as much of normal as we can provide. And our students and our families, our communities have been excellent. They've done everything we've asked of them and more. Um, our students have followed our rules and expectations. Uh, they've done an amazing job uh, in terms of helping us to reimagine school for a third time in three years. Um, and so, and I thank all of our supports uh, from central office, from my director who is on the phone with me every day as we navigate new learning and how to adjust to it as principals. I do want to share, I believe we have a video from my PTSA president. So I'd like to give her a chance Sorry about the bells. We really are in a school. So I would like to um, have you hear from our PTSA president, her perspective on how we've done in terms of communication. Hello, I'm Carolyn Parker. I am the president of Paint Branch High School's PTSA. I am also the treasurer of the school's Instrumental Music Booster Club. I have a senior at Paint Branch. I also have a 10th grader. I've actually been around the school for five years. My son started um, marching band when he was in eighth grade. So I 
feel like I know the community pretty well. I've been around um, and just I'm a proud parent of, paint, of, of students at Paint Branch High School. Dr. Mirsha asked me to make a few comments about communication, parental communication in the age post COVID. So here are my thoughts. Here's my stream of consciousness. I think Dr. Mirsha has done a fantastic job giving us multiple access points to communication at the school, whether it be through the school's website, through her short um, targeted emails, or through Twitter. She's really used uh, the, so the various social media platforms available to her as principal to communicate. Her communication around back to school night, we had a virtual back to school night a few weeks ago, great uh, attendance um, and access to the teachers. It was very, very, very well organized with links that were easily accessible and a really understandable schedule. So I think we had, I, I as a parent got great, um, got great information about my, my kids' classes through the, through the event. I think outside of what Dr. Mersha has done, the move of the PTSA to an electronic platform called Member Hub has meant uh, ease of communication from PTSA to their members more broadly and made joining the PTSA easier. We are now holding our PTSA meetings virtually, so that's really enhanced attendance. People don't have to drive their kids somewhere, go home, grab dinner, and get back to the school. People can hop on um, from their computer um, or from their phone. I think also um, Dr. Mirsha has made uh, the football games available to other parent groups other than the athletic boosters, which has allowed a group like the music boosters who don't typically have access to those big events, able to get out there, make the group known uh, to the to the community and do some fundraising. So I think just really simple um, simple actions like that make and facilitate communication post COVID. Happy to talk with you more about this. Dr. Mirsha has my cell phone number and my email if you'd like to reach out to me directly or if you have other questions. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Take care. Thank you. Um, so as you can see, I think that while we lost a sense of community, we are slowly regaining that. Uh, we figured out how to communicate and keep our parents informed using as much technology as possible and using different technology to reach different audiences. Uh, the parent who gets the email on Synergy um, you know, may, may be different than the parent who sees the information on the website, may be different than the person who sees the information on uh, social media. So we are just with every message that we send, we send it out in multiple ways uh, to make sure that it is getting to as many people as possible. So I think we figured that out, um, figured out how to bring parents safely back into the building in appropriate ways. Again, had a parent teacher meeting this morning as well in person. Um, and so we're working through making sure our community knows what we're doing, how we're doing it, and that they feel a connection to the school and their child's education. As I said, where we struggle on uh, meeting the needs of our multilingual students, meeting the needs of our parents that may not be as comfortable with technology. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Tomas. She's going to talk a little bit about um, as a school in the NEC, uh, we typically have an open house, which is critical. It's been um, a huge part of making sure that our students in eighth grade, our feeders, can really make a selection, um, their high school selection. So between Springbrook and Blake and Paint Branch, we have so many different signature programs. And it is important for our students to get an overview of those programs and really make a decision about the school and the program that meets their needs. It is very hard to do so much of that virtually. We used to have a open house that was well attended with large numbers of people. We understand that that is not something that we can do this year. So we are currently doing the work of rethinking how we can do the same thing um, so that our students and our parents have information and why is this important? So if you haven't been to Paint Branch, a student that uh, wants to be in our medical careers program is going to actually see a hospital room. A student interested in TV media productions is going to see a TV studio. And so we want to make sure that our students see the facility um, and the CTE programs that we have without 
having the ability to necessarily bring them in for a large open house to visit the school. So I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Tomas. She'll talk about some of what she's already done as our NEC Signature Coordinator for Paint Branch and some of her ideas as she prepares for um, our open house, which is October, I believe, 20th. So Ms. Tomas. Thank you, Dr. Mirshaw. I am also very happy to be here. Um, I have also learned uh, quite a bit today from listening to everybody. Um, I know the big theme here is traditions, and I feel very strongly um, about our traditions at Paint Branch. Uh, this is my 20th year working here, and um, prior to that, I attended as a student. So um, Paint Branch has been like a second home to me, um, and we love to keep our traditions. We feel, feel very strongly about them here at Paint Branch. Um, so as Dr. Marshall said, being in consortium has added a layer to community outre outreach. Um, we do have a bigger, bigger community we are reaching. Um, community outreach specifically related to our Northeast Consortium. Uh, open House has presented new challenges with the restrictions put in place due to COVID. Our open house has been a, an important tradition for our staff and students. One, our community of eighth grade students and parents in the consortium have come to look forward to attending. It is typically a huge event where band, palms, cheerleaders would open up the evening on stage. Parents and students heard from our principal and athletic director among others, and then were escorted through the building by student ambassadors who would highlight the wonderful programs we have at Paint Branch. Many teachers and students were part of the event showcasing our outstanding facility, um, student work and class choices, as well as what clubs we have available for our students. We would also use this time to have counselors and resource teachers available to talk one-on-one -on -one with parents as they took the tour to answer any questions specific to their child. It was a great way to show students and parents the opportunities they would have at Paint Branch, as well as to get them excited for their ninth grade high school experience. This year, we had to get a little creative to still create that feeling of excitement for students. We still want them to be enthusiastic to come to Paint Branch. We will be modifying our open house with a plan of sharing a video that our wonderful television production students and teacher have created that highlights our specialty and signature programs like NJROTC, restaurant management, and science and media, among others. We will be releasing the video on the evening of October 20th in an online newsletter with additional information they would want to know when choosing their school, including the pieces like clubs and electives we have. Counselors, administrators, and resource teachers will then be available on Zoom for parents and students to come on and ask specific questions based on their areas of interest. We will also be seeking information from families at this time in order to be able to communi continue communications with them after the evening. Again, we are reaching a much broader community, so we need a way of accessing the parents that are, are definitely interested in coming to Paint Branch so we, we can follow up. We are looking to create a list of parents who would then be interested in visiting the school following the open house for small group tours after school. We still want to be able to offer students and parents who are interested in seeing the facility a chance to do so in a safe way. So if we're looking at possibly groups of 10 um, at a time that I would be able to, to walk through the building and again, highlight the facility. Um, we have so many spaces that are unique to Paint Branch, including our you know, million do dollar real working kitchen, our wonderful child development area, um, our theater. Um, so without being able to see those, those places in person, it definitely makes it uh, a little bit more difficult to know what you're, you're getting into uh, when getting to Paint Branch. So those are some of the things. Um, we are also uh, working closely with eighth grade counselors. We just had our breakfast tour options fair um, where we, uh, each of our schools shared the programs that are specific to Paint Branch uh, that make it special. Um, and then those counselors will have a chance to talk to um, their students so that they can highlight the programs that we have here. So those are the, some of the things that we're doing. Um, and again, we are still looking for ways to get creative to reach all the parents that we can. Thank you, Ms. Tomas. Um, so to, to in summary, uh, first, we love Paint Branch High School. We want everyone who uh, can hear that to hear that. It's an amazing school community with very dedicated educators. And I think that's the other piece that's important to, to highlight. The physical building is just a physical building. Our students did well last year through virtual because how much our teachers did. But at the same time, our focus this year is just about that connection. So not just sending the information out and hoping that it was received, but making that con connection with our community in whatever way that we can, um, it is important for them to feel that they are a part of our school um, and that they are part of what's happening and that they know and understand what we're working towards here at Paint Branch. 
Uh, so we're we're working together um, to, and we're problem solving constantly. We're thinking about ways to do things. Um, we have to continue to reimagine and come up with new solutions. I know it was mentioned earlier, we have asked for feedback from our parents. Um, we ask for a lot of student voice data from our students. I think they're tired of filling out Google Forms. Um, but I will highlight that we sent one out to our students the first week of school asking them very specific uh, questions about how they felt about being back in a building. High schools are busy places, uh, 2,100 students. Many of them had been very isolated um, prior to school starting. So we wanted to get that feedback from them about how it felt. Did they feel comfortable? Did they feel a connection to the school? Um, consider that for high school, our ninth graders are new to us, our 10th graders are new to us, and our 11th graders had only been in school for a short period of time. They were underclassmen the last time that they were inside the building. Our current seniors were 10th graders the last time they were in the building. So we are dealing with a lot of new and so we wanted to, to really get a feel for how our students felt. So the survey that we sent out and our students filled out um, close to 90% across all categories felt comfortable being in the building, felt safe being in the building, felt that they had already made a connection to an adult that they could turn to if they needed. Uh, that's really our focus um, in terms of our community and communication is sharing what we're doing, um, continuing to build community, finding ways to connect with people in person, in real and meaningful ways. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to share about Paint Branch. No, thank you, Dr. Mirshaw. Um, so that was great to hear and appreciate um, you talking about making the con connection in which, whatever way you can. Um, I'm gonna say this, this is my own personal thoughts. I follow you on Twitter. You are a Twitter extraordinaire, oh my goodness. So I can only imagine what your emails are like because you are very in formative on Twitter, and then you share things like the student selfies when your um, your desk is mobile. Um, with outdoor lunch, you went to Popeye's and you saw the kids, right, to make sure everybody was staying safe, and you show how teachers are using our, out, our outdoor space to teach. So you've just been here a little over a year. So I just want to say thank you for coming, fitting and right in and making it work during a challenging time and not making it look challenging. Um, you always seem to be having a good time and you enjoy the kids and I see the pep rallies and the football games and everything. So I get everything I need to know. If not from Ms. Dixon, I can see it on Twitter from you. So I appreciate that. Um, you, we just can't say enough. Um, all the work that has been done during this time, we could not have imagined what it would have looked like. Um, and I'm sure there are times when you all have created um, ways to make it work, right? Um, just been really creative. And um, as I'm hoping that um, for those of you who have, who have not been able to meet with your um, your peers in person that you are finding a way to do that really soon. I do know it's some, you know, it's different when you're able to be in person and synergize together. I know you can text and call and email, but it's something to be said about being in, per in person. But I know right now um, there is uh, a commitment and a devotion to getting everything up and running at school. And so just um, hoping that you all continue to share the stories with the board. We, we do need to hear it. And um, it helps our community to hear what it looks like, right? Because it's not easy, right? And, and so um, in, in your efforts of making it look easy, um, people sometimes want more and demand more. And so um, I just ask you to be patient with us as we ask questions to be informed, as we make decisions that are really important, right? And that impact you and everyone in the building and in our community. Um, but I, I, I just say thanks. And I wanted to also give thanks on behalf of Mrs. Smondrowski. Um, she had to leave to go to another meeting at noon. And I know we're over, but I do feel like it was so worth it. This was such a great meeting today. I really, really appreciate hearing from each and every one of you, sharing your stories. 
Um, Ms. Thomas, you've been with us for 20 years at Peyton Ranch, your alumni, that's great. Um, Ms. Parker was good and um, I think it's great when we have parents who stick around and stay and help. And I did hear in a previous um, presentation that some of the challenges have been parent volunteers. And I, I know that um, the community wants to be able to come in and see what it looks like and help support in any way that's possible. So I, um, I'm hopeful that we'll find ways to safely allow parents to volunteer or help virtually. I did hear that virtual is working in ways that we could not have imagined. So I'll ask um, Ms. Silvestri if she has any questions or comments that she wants to say before we sign off, but just um, thank you to all of you. No, thank you. I appreciated hearing from the high school perspective. Um, I appreciate hearing the struggles and efforts that you have undertaken to get the, the parent view challenge accomplished and it's ongoing, right? And so I think we need to hear that so that we know it's hard, but then we come together to come up with solutions to get 100% of our parents on parent view because um, again, this year is so important that parents are more uh, aware of the the progress and the challenges that their kids are having so hopefully they can talk to their teachers and do something about it. Um, I hope the central office is able to help you and support you with your translation challenge. Again, you shouldn't have to figure it out on your own when we have a collective knowledge and experience over decades uh, dealing with this and um, um, yeah, so thank you very much. I appreciate the, the presentation. Yes. And I'm also looking forward to seeing the video that you're going to send to your um, parents about what Peyton Branch has to offer. I think that's great that you're going to offer tours and still do something virtual, but have a video that really tells the story because it's different um, when you can't be in person to actually see it. So I'm hoping you share that on Twitter. I'd love to see that, um, retweet that so other people can see that um, as they're thinking about where uh, their children will go. So. With that being said, thank you, thank you. Um, great meeting, Chris. I don't, um, Mr. Pram. I don't know, or you, or Mr. Davis, if you something you want to say or add before um, we leave. But I just, if I may, and thank sure. you, Ms. Evans. I just want to say thank you. I know we're over time. I will not make this long. But to our principals and our guests today, in the middle of a school day, thank you so much for coming to share these stories, for bringing those other voices through video. I think it really helped us to understand what is. You know, really important about school communications, which is connections and relationships, and it is no small amount of work, but yet how important it is to do, because it really helps students be successful and families be connected. So thank you. And um, Mr. Davis, I don't know if you wanted to say anything. Yes, the only thing I would say in closing, again, thank you to the principals. I know as a former principal, it's, it's a heavy lift. Uh, and I was not a principal during the pandemic, so I, I know it's an even heavier lift, especially during the school day. But I just want to thank you for, uh, I think the word was used, uh, vulnerable, sharing, vul being vulnerable, uh, and also sharing what is working, what are some of the challenges, how we can support. Uh, but also, what, uh, one of my takeaways is that traditions are live and well, continue to be. A catalyst for creativity and innovation, and that it's not too late to start new traditions as well. So I would just just leave us with with that thought as we move forward. Perfect ending, Mr. Davis. Thank you. Thank you all. And so we'll let you go back and um, do what you do best, run your school. So take care, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.